Thanks, Will. And Scott, and uh, thanks everybody for turning up tonight on a, God, what day of the week is it? Thursday evening. Um, as Will said, I'm an architect, but I also teach at the Bartlett um, Technology first year, but I also teach at the AA occasionally at their design make course out at Hook Park. This all sticks together because, sorry, that was a bit of a pun. Partly to do with this building, but partly to do with the fact that I'm a Yank. I grew up in the, at the southern edge rim of the great north woods of North America on a, in a city called Minneapolis, which was forest before that city got built. And where I grew up was an expanding ring of suburbia. And our woods that we played in, which was full of witches and all sorts of demons in the middle of woods, we constructed tree houses. And that was the beginnings of understanding not just a little bit about timber, which I'm a bit obsessed with, but a lot about forestry. And what we didn't know at the time is what we were seeing is in the middle of these woods was a farmhouse, which seemed weird, given this is forest. What we found out later is that what we were building tree houses in was secondary growth. So all that woodland had been cleared to make farms probably 120 years earlier. And this had regrown in about 60 years. It's a good news story um, because it shows that nature is incredibly resilient. This building at the Wheel and Downland Open Air Museum is a workshop. It's a conservation workshop, but it's also an artifact store. So it's made out of sticks, about 15 kilometers of French oak lads, 25 by 35 mil. When this project entered the office, it was theoretical. So nobody wanted to take it on because everybody in the office at Cullinan's wanted to do real projects. Nobody really believed this was a flyer. What they didn't reckon was that the director of the museum, a man called Chris Zoyner, was an expert at raising money and confidence. So he convinced the museum to build this project, the first permanent grid shell, timber grid shell, ever built. So it was a bit of a risk job. So I was quite happy, given I was quite keen to work with timber. And uh, the building took about six years to make. Um, sorry, Teo, it doesn't want to move again. Um, so if anybody knows shell construction, it's a lot different than a normal framed timber building in that forces in a building like this don't, that's That's it. Thanks, Dave. Thank you. So it's an extreme test of what timber can do, medium-sized building, and building it out of sticks, literally, in order to make a shell that's flat when it begins with, and then you form it. So it's a bit like building a sculpture when you're building a building like this. But in fact, it comes from that. In this case, it's oak. In the case of the grid shell, this is Kentish woodland. And I find this another big inspiration. This is farmland up against woodland. So you get that edge where you get a monoculture on your right and you get diverse woodland on your left. In the corner of that woodland is a hole that you punch through and that's what you get. So this is the same piece of land, in effect the same soil, but you end up with a completely different world of biodiversity, birdsong, um, all sorts, deer running around, the sorts of thing that you don't see in a farm field. <coughs> So with the grid shell building, all of a sudden, we were looking at building a building that was organic, not just out of the materials that were, went into it, but in the way it was built. Um, so it was bent into shape, just like these baskets. And this is 20 years on, so I was down there about three months ago to celebrate the 20th anniversary, as Will said, of the building. It's become a conservation project in itself. It's not just a conservation workshop anymore. But one of the great things about the Wheeldon Downland as a museum is that don't, they don't stand still. They teach timber framing, conservation, all this sort of stuff. Once you get exposed to that, it becomes extremely exciting and inspiring because you're working with carpenters, you're working with blacksmiths, you're working with glaziers, all sorts of people who do, who do care about what they're doing. And carpenters in particular um, quite often are running job sites this is another inspiration, so as I said, design make at, at the AA. I teach out there very occasionally. Um, but it's a laboratory. It's very AA, it's, it's inward looking. It doesn't influence the local community much at all. And that's fine, 
because it allows them to get on and do the sorts of projects that you wouldn't normally get a chance to do because you're your own client and your own builder. While in Berlin a couple of summers ago, I discovered in the middle of Berlin a square where in a corner of the square, they had a course, summer school, for children who were building buildings in the middle of the square. The most popular course they ran with these children up to about 12 years old was demolition. <laughs> and you realize this is quite a wonderful thing, that it's not, we're not just builders, we're also destroyers by nature. And to see how that has tugs on the heartstrings of children is quite impressive. This is a little project I did uh, about 12 years ago um, to build a fence across St. Anne's Gardens to secure a garden in Wardour Street in Soho. Lots of drug dealing, rough sleeping going on. Uh, our boys' primary school was in Soho and they had no playground. So we turned this in to a playground. Our summer fair morphed into the Soho Food Festival. And all of a sudden that locked in my mind how valuable community space is for communities, but also how important food is for getting people to talk to each other. So this is now the center of food culture in London. Not the garden, but Soho. Um, another inspiration, a man called Andy Trotman. He's a structural engineer, worked for Overarp and Partners for quite a long time, got fed up with that, and became a designer, maker, builder, working in timber. So we work together quite a lot. This is his empire, <clears throat> excuse me, near Berkhamsted, north of London. Um, he bought an 18-acre woodland, uses his own timber, manages his own woodland, has raised a young family out of his own timber. He's built a barn in order to be able to build furniture in small buildings. This is almost entirely made out of the timber straight off his site, except for the roof. And this is what's wonderful. Again, like working with carpenters, working with really talented structural engineers who enjoy working with timber, is a godsend as well. And this is what they get up to. So this entire vaulted roof arrived as CNC cut pieces of plywood on a single flatbed lorry and went up in about three days. All sorts of little pavilions. This shows what people can do with timber. As I said, I'm obsessed. So this whole talk, I'm afraid, is about timber. And you're going to see a lot of greenery along the course of this story. But Andy would just, he's a utilitarian. When he wants to build a building for a function, this is what he does. So little pavilions turn up, and this is a house that we co-designed for his family, which he built in phases on the quiet as he could when he had enough time to do it. It's an upturned boat. Um, this is moving on to Flimwell. Okay, so this is southeast near Tunbridge Wells, about an hour and a bit outside London, easy to get to. This is not to be confused with Flimwell Park. It's on the other side of the Hastings Road, but it's a innovation center for timber uh, and forestry training, so design, construction, and forestry. So we built a whole succession of experimental workshop buildings within this woodland. And when I say woodland, it's ancient woodland. So very, very difficult to get planning for. But because it was, had the promise of being able to offer up employment to people, workspace, and be part of the regeneration of an ancient woodland, the planners let it go through. So we built a succession of workshops within that woodland, part round pole, glue lamb structures, um, but otherwise just pure timber. So lots of Douglas fir, lots of um, sweet chestnut, which is being experimented with. Um, and it's inserting buildings almost surgically into the woodland. So none of these buildings were built in woodland itself. There are no trees cleared. This is all industrial land um, up until about the 1970s. So East Sussex County Council own this property and it's a trust that run it. So this is a private company where they build ropes courses in the middle of jungles and forests all over the world. They built their own building. They'd never built a building before, but they build ropes courses. And to them, they work in Tibet, they work in China, they work in Canada, in the middle of forests. This was easy for them. And this entire building was built without scaffolding, without a crane. They just did it through lifting, just use of pulleys and ropes. It was truly, truly fascinating. And using tools like this, this is a wood miser. This is all a bit uh, mechanical, but it's really very, very important when it comes to making use of local timber. This machine can be dragged in by a horse into the middle of woodland. It can turn a log up to about 700 mil in diameter in the boards on the spot. 
That's bigger than you can feed through a British sawmill standing. So this is revolutionizing forestry and timber construction. So part of my work is to try to get timber into the construction industry um, more than it has been. So since uh, the beginning of the 20th century, timber went out of fashion, um, partly because of two world wars, all the skills got lost. Carpenters, uh, foresters were lost in those wars and it never really recovered. But it is now. This is a woodland in Surrey. It is an actual working woodland. So they're producing huge amounts of timber in this woodland while people are cycling through it or horse riding or running or just <laughs> meditating. This has to be a working woodland. It's fascinating. It's an industrial source, but at the same time, it's a leisure and beauty spot. And this is what's so wonderful about working with this material is that this is what you get stuck into if you want to. This is Flimwell Park. So this is where it started for me. Um, the clients bought the site 20 years, 25 years ago at auction. Didn't know what they were going to do with it, but they saw the Woodland Enterprise Center and said, could we do something like that on this piece of land opposite the Woodland Enterprise Center? It was a bird park, like a zoo for birds. This was the visitor center, completely trashed because the site was left in limbo for 20 years. The beauty of this is, is that 20 years, um, we get to see what nature does to itself if you take the human element out of woodland that has been managed by human beings for 10,000 years. Once you remove people, nature turns in on itself. Okay, so that's London to the top left, Hastings to the bottom right, East Kent on the right, East Sussex on the left. Tunbridge Wells is just a bit further to the north. Big Lake, Buell Water, Bedgebury Pinatum, the la largest experimental pine forest in England. These are the two sites side by side. So the workshops I was showing before, the bottom left, and then this is Flimwell Park. So you can just see the visitor center there. But it's strip development. Flimwell itself is a non-village. About 1,000 people, no center. What we're doing is building a center for that place. It's never really had a center. The crossroads of the A21 and the road that the Hawkehurst Road was a very important crossing. Um, Flimwell's in the Doomsday Book. It's very historical, but there's nobody there. So part of, the, part of the challenge for this project was to try to get something going for the woodland. And as far as we were concerned, that something was woodland, to try to reinvigorate timber within the construction industry in order to make it worthwhile for foresters to do their job, and more importantly, to try to get farmers to plant more trees because we've got a lot of tree planting to do, as most of us know. That is the site that we took over, not pretty. Um, we were terrified because it had been left for 20 years that it was going to be full of awful stuff. It wasn't, it wasn't bad actually. Um, it was rough. Uh, we had to dig our way back into the woodland because trees had grown everywhere. Um, that's the ruin of the visitor center. So we knew that was a goner. It had a steel frame in it. We chopped that down because it all rusted at the base and the farmer took it and built a barn from it. So everything that we're using on the site, we're trying to put to use. All the wastes, everything. Um, this shows what the woodland was doing to itself. So rhododendrons had piled in. You couldn't even walk through this woodland except for a couple of paths. The, there were 14 ponds dug. This was uh, Doodlebug Alley. So any bomb that fell on this site would have created a crater. And Flim Well is not called Flim Well for accidental reasons. It's full of water. The streams are running through the hills in this area. So this site, any hole becomes a swimming pool for <laughs> invertebrates or people. This was a glade in the middle of the wood. This is the picnic ground when it was a bird park. There were slides and swings and all that stuff in that area. There are specimen trees from all over the world that are on this site. So big sequoias, uh, trees from Japan, from China, everywhere even big English oaks that are six, 700 years old. So all these need looking after. This is the heart, or the blood, I should say, of the site. That's an iron spring. So in the spring, when the water really is running through the winter, it bubbles up through the ground and it pumps iron out of the ground. And this was the first industrial use of the site as a source of iron. So they would have dug what are called hammer ponds in the middle of the woods, and those would have operated cantilever hammers and they would have smelted the iron using the wood from the trees, 
and they would make ingots that would be smashed by these big hammers. Think Tolkien and uh, Lord of the Rings when they're taking whole oak trees and melting, smelting iron to make swords and shields and all that sort of stuff. That is what inspired Tolkien. This was going on in this area because of the water power, the timber for fuel, the clay in the ground, and the iron. Rhododendrons, I mentioned, they're beautiful for a short period of time in the year, but they are noxious things. That is one of the first, one of the oldest rhododendrons um, in the area, so we have to actually protect it. But the rest of them were, trying, were being paid by the Forestry Commission to remove it. The ponds have weeded over because they didn't, haven't been getting sunlight for years. Lots of mushrooms. We'll mention we've got a good restaurant on the site, Michelin Green Star. They pick these and they serve them to their um, customers. But this is one of the big aims. You probably can't see that on the left. But um, woodland farming and agroforestry. Going back to that Soho project, understanding that food is very important. If you're going to convince farmers to plant trees, we've got to convince them that it's not going to be to the detriment of food. So there are ways of doing this. And this is what we're setting Flimwell Park up to do, is to try to grow food and trees side by side. So working with the restaurant, um, they'll be growing food, not just in the woodland and around the woodland, but also on the buildings, which have all been designed in order to have gardens on their roofs. So these are the main aims of the project. Um, I'm not going to go through these, just because we've got a lot to get through. Um, but Basically, it's to try to reinvigorate the local economy and the community through this project. That's the 1960 view of the site. So you just see a patch here, which was quarried for sand and gravel, and then it was grazed afterwards. But you can see um, on the tail end of World War II, there's still allotments along the road left over from the war. So all of that roadside was valuable food growing area. So we're just trying to bring that habit back. All of the built project is within that square. So that's considered a brownfield site for, by the planners. Um, we're looking to build this as a mixed use scheme. So this would have workspace, teaching space, housing, and some retail on it. So that was a big ask for the planners. That's the bird park in about 1990, I think. Um, so they were hollowing out the trees, and you can see the pond chain that they were beginning to, the dig, to dig. Some of those would have been hammer ponds, some would have been craters. But that's what happens, is that these just fill up with water, because the water streams in from the north straight onto the site. We're having to deal with that. That's the first planning drawing for it. So workshop studio spaces on the south side of the site, up against the woodland, a big workshop here some housing along the street front with gardens. So it's starting to expand the landscape toward the woodland, but trying to protect the woodland at the same time. The planners didn't like that. They wanted to keep the view of the woodland from the road open, so they didn't like the big block of workshops. They said, can we break these up? And when people mention planning, it's not always a horrible thing. It quite often works out far, far for the better, because they recommend things that you wouldn't necessarily think of yourself. So the second go, which eventually got through planning, was to break that block of workshops up into small workshop buildings, and then to break the houses up into smaller units spread out through the site. So these were just early image drawings that we used to, to show the community what it was we were up to. At that time, they changed the planning situation, which meant that if you had 85% or more support from the community at a vote, even if it was outside a development area and on a protected site like this one, again, ancient woodland, 22 hectares, 24, um, that it would, should go through planning. But it was certainly not a certainty because of the housing. Getting workspace through planning is not that big a problem, but getting housing through is extremely difficult in terms of setting negative precedent. That is a zoning of the site showing how the woodland was when we took it over. So these are different zones where we had some brownfield site, some parts had been cleared for the birds, some parts had, had ponds put in them, other parts had just been left for coppice wood. Does everybody here know what coppicing is? Does anybody? It's where you cut a tree pretty well down to the ground and some trees then sprout back up again and they give you new rounds of timber that you can use liberally. I'll show you some in some of the photos. So that's the site um, with the agreed planning layout. 
at the top. Um, that is the slope of the site, so very basic drawing showing the contours. South facing, which is really handy. Drops about 35 meters from the north end to the south. You can see the pond chain in one section. That's an agroforestry plan set up to show how we could start growing food within this woodland. There are all sorts of restrictions that the Forestry Commission put on. If you take money from the Forestry Commission, you've got to play by their rules. But with climate change on, the rules are completely up in the air. So nobody knows what's going to be growing in this country in 30 years' time. And that's what you're looking at when you're planting trees, is what's going to survive the next 30, 60, 100 years. And we don't know. So we've got some time to be a little bit innovative and adventurous. So this is what is being built. So almost everything to the left is now constructed. The three houses are being built as we speak. They should finish around the first of the year, next year. Um, that's the big workshop. So from the start, the Bartlett were involved with this project. So they're interested in getting students out of London into the woodland. So we had to provide some accommodation for them as well, and a big workshop and a woodland. But this workshop originally was a restaurant, teaching restaurant. Going back a couple. At the beginning, we had a workshop for the Bartlett at the bottom of the site, linking to the Woodland Enterprise workshops to the west. So that's the workshop. It's a, a series of frames, um, Douglas fir, all local timber. Um, while this is going on, there's enough. I'm just a one-man band. I should have described that to begin with. Um, so <laughs> while I was doing this, there's enough repetition in this project for me to teach myself my first lessons in CAD. So these are all boring rhino drawings, I'm afraid. <laughs> you have to look at for a second. Um, but it was a real eye-opener for me. Everything before that was all drawn by hand. So this was a real opportunity to start testing systems quickly, whether it be frame systems or panel systems. Almost all of these buildings were built as paneled buildings, some hybrid with frames. So the houses are completely panelized. The big workshop is frame and panels. A bicycle shop, which was our energy store, is now a bicycle shop, um, is panels and a frame. And then the workshops are frame-based, but panel boxes. This all makes sense in a second. These are the workshops. So these are small workshops. The workshops we built previously at the Woodland Enterprise Center were too big. We found that local craftspeople which, and artists, which, which are the people we were trying to attract, found them too large. So we downscaled them by half. So these are about four meters by 12, two stories tall, eight of them. They were originally framed buildings with um, solid timber on the outside to brace them. Uh, more images showing the big workshop with what is the restaurant. And these are the workshops. They have to work with a sloping site. There's a lot of contours going on in this site. But we had to provide level access to all the buildings. So rather than putting the buildings on the ground, the client were quite keen um, and adventurous to do these as stilted buildings and keep the levels of the buildings level with each other and let the ground fall beneath them. And then this is the accommodation block. So this is a classic 1960s, 70s passive solar design. It's banked into what was the road embankment. We built a concrete beam, in effect, across the base of the embankment, and then backfilled over the top of it. Highly insulated, uh, about 60 meter run of solar panels. Another good news story, I'll explain in a minute. But the top of it would be garden. That's the introduction to the site. <coughs> These are two affordable dwellings, um, both occupied at the moment. We've got a young family who run, manage the site, and they run courses on the site. He works in the woodland. Two young kids and the second of these houses is occupied by our builders. We're building the larger houses. So these are panelized buildings, split level. These are the larger houses. So quite a lot larger. In fact, they've been built much larger than this. We had to revise the planning because the client was thinking about turning these into semi-detached units. So the ones that are being built, we've had to reapply for planning for these houses if we did that. So we kept them in single buildings, but they're pretty enormous. That is the workshop for the Bartlett 
But the planners said, no, it's too deep into the woodland. Could we put the Bartlett in the big workshop at the top? I keep mentioning the word Bartlett. This is intended to be open. This is not necessarily only for the Bartlett. It can be used by other people as well. That's the plan. Um, but that's a building to happen yet. So this is the remnants of the visitor center, Bartlett staff turning up. But while the project was being built, we were using the Woodland Enterprise Center as our base camp for the Bartlett students. So this was August. The students self-organized this trip in their own time, and they camped out in the woods for about four nights, cooking their own food. Um, but this woman here had a really nice contact into a company, ex-architects, called um, Tensile Tents, based in Bristol. And they just happened to be doing a new range, and they said, we could use a group of their tents as long as the students posed for their next brochure. So we had a deal where we built a village, aerial village, in the middle of the woodland, which was really useful because the people in the high wheeled area of its outstanding natural beauty office who are on this site were terrified about students stomping on orchids and whatever else was on the ground. So the whole village was elevated off the ground. But it was a workshop. Again, we just let them do whatever they wanted to do and supply them with a bit of timber. So that's Rosie there. So she was the one who worked for the company that got the tents. They built the tables, they built chairs, and they built a cinema in the middle of the woods. We watched films every night. This is the Bartlett starting to spring into action at Flumwell Park. Although the project was being built, they were working in the woods. Um, so this is one of the design units. Um, so looking at how they used to smelt iron on the site. Um, this woman, Natalia, was smelting and casting aluminium. It takes less heat to do that. Uh, this is David Saunders, the man in the rust-colored jumper. He is the mastermind behind basically both these projects. He's a forester, used to work for East Sussex County Council. He brought the Woodland Enterprise Center into being, almost single-handedly. This is Christine Meadows, another forester. So she was working with the students, trying to show them how to measure the height of a tree and the volume of a tree to work out how much timber can come out of a standing tree before you even knock it down. And then Nick Meach, designer, artist, Forrester, um, he was teaching them how to split logs using nothing more than wooden mallets and wedges. This is David and me starting work on the site with scythes, starting to clear that glade. We ended up bringing in a mower on a tractor from Plumpton College because it's going to take forever. Once that was mown for the first time in 20 years, up popped this plant called Heathlobelia, which is about 350 mil maximum height, tiny little orchid-like flower. But when our ecologist saw this growing, he phoned up a botanist friend who came over and said, we thought that plant was extinct in the British Isles. So a big gulp, we thought that was it for the project construction until we got a handle on this. They said, no, it's fine. Just protect it for two and a half years. That's the plant. Not overly impressive, but it has got hope, prospects for cardiovascular treatments. Getting back to the site, once we started digging, our ecologists found that we had Japanese knotweed on the site to make matters more difficult. So we had to fence off part of the site right where our accommodation block was going. As we started to excavate, we were finding barn frames, lots of tires, um, all sorts. This looks a bit like <laughs> a uh, scorched earth setting, but it's just the beginnings of the clearance of the site. This was all clear before the site was abandoned as a bird park. So we're just turning it back into what it was before. Um, we moved a family into a caravan. Security was really important, so they had chickens and children there. So that stopped people going onto the site and willy-nilly nicking stuff as we moved equipment on the site. Um, as I said, you dig a hole on the site and it immediately fills up with water. These are the foundations going in for the small workshops. That's Matt Blackwell, a genius. He lives in Suffolk, but he's been camping with two of his sons on this site for the last three years. And this project wouldn't have happened without him. There's no question in my mind. And this is the beauty about working in this way. It's, think about Lutchens or Voise. This is basically going back to their world. I would produce drawings. They would take those drawings and they'd say, we can build it, but we're going to build it this way. So you have to give up some of your license and some of your control as an architect 
when you work that way. But for me, it was a dream come true because these guys knew what they were doing. I could only make broad guesses as to how this thing would go together. They knew the supply chains. They knew the restrictions. They knew how to get timber cheaply. These are the first small workshops going in. Panels, SIP panels, structural insulated panels, made in Essex. They were pretty bad. There are a lot of cowboys out there, and that was our first lesson, is not to hire cowboys. They were okay. They were fine. But we knew we could do better. So that is the accommodation block. As I mentioned, it's a big concrete block, retaining wall. Um, just dug out a bit so we could get to the back of it. Very <coughs> insulated. Uh, that's the only, that's the largest quantity of concrete we've got on the site by a long way. It's a bunker, but it's doing an awful lot. Retaining earth, keeping the water. Um, it's working as a coffer dam, um, but it's got to stay warm and cool all year round. So those are the first small workshops going up. Uh, the big workshop is on the left-hand side, or will be. Gonna, so I'm going to go through these qu quickly now. Um, this is the bicycle shop going up, the base, and then you can see the tables, which are the, the bases of the small workshops. That is the large workshop going up, so it's a, it's a um, series of concrete block on top of uh, reinforced concrete beams, um, and then a power floated floor will go on the top of that. So it's very beginnings in the ground, it's very basic construction, there's nothing innovative about this at all. That's a leftover pumping station, still pumping sewage. Um, we're having to enlarge that as we speak. This is where things really took off for us because the client and the owner of the site played tennis in Wimbledon with an Estonian man whose family make structural insulated panels like we've never seen before. You might just be able to see in this slide, but there's a very thick layer of timber, very thick plywood is the easiest way to describe it. This building arrived from Estonia, three-day trip. So it was a final leg from Germany to the site. It arrived at 10 o'clock. We went away for lunch, and by the time we got back from lunch, the building was two-thirds up. So this revolutionized everything. We knew Chris and Matt had never built in timber before. This is the first time they've ever done anything like this. They're developer builders. So for them, this was a risk, but it was fun. They're really up for the adventure. And they were really, really keen to, to lead the show. This is the accommodation block, the solar canopy going up. Again, this is really straightforward, simple stuff. There's nothing challenging about this whatsoever. Uh, this is the leftovers. So this is mass concrete, which was the foundation of the visitor center. So again, getting back to not wanting to throw anything off the site, these were perfect for starting our retaining wall structures. So everything is going back into the project again that we take out of the ground. Eventually, Gabians take over for the retaining wall. So that becomes habitat. Every time we left any bit of concrete on the site, in the sun particularly, it would fill up with lizards. They loved the warmth, the concrete in the sun. So this became a biohabitat. So that now is full of, we took away their habitat and replaced it with Gabians. That is the completed building. So that's the first building built out of the panels from Estonia that have changed everything for us. Um, those are the workshops, small ones getting near ready. Those are them up against the woodland. Um, all the roofs are accessible. These are full of solar panels now because I mentioned solar is a good news story, and it is, because when we started, this is all notional. So think 10, 12 years ago, uh, the solar panels were still inefficient and they're expensive. Now they're very efficient and cheap. So this has changed everything. Um, so solar panels are going on to just about all of the roofs in some way. This is the big workshop going up, Douglas fir frame. So it's quite a big thing. It's not, it's like a medieval barn, but if this was a medieval barn, it would be half the size of timbers. The reason that these timbers are so big is because there's a greenhouse and solar space going onto the roof of that. So it's an industrial load. So you can see the big Estonian cross-laminated panels, or sorry, um, SIP panels going on top. So they're doing all of the bracing of these frames along with glue lambs. Otherwise, it's straight, solid, green timber. So those are the panels. And you can see even the dormers, the projecting bays, are made out of panels. So it's very simple. They just arrive on site already in the shape you need them. You just <coughs> put them up in place and screw them in. 
and you've got a completely insulated wrapped building. Cortem steel, referring back to the iron of the site, but you can see how quickly these materials change when they're exposed to the weather. That's the big workshop, nearly finished. A fair amount of earthworks. That's the restaurant now, because the big, what was the big restaurant is um, workshop. That's the cross laminated panels working with glue lamb frames. So this is moving on, seeing it getting to a point where in the winter you get a completely different environment, obviously, because the trees shed their leaves. They're all main, mainly ash, birch, and sweet chestnut. So you get this wonderful change of light through the year. Um, but these buildings, one of my biggest interest points is to see what the ecology would do underneath these buildings. The idea is just to leave really rough soil on it and just let the woodland take over. And that's what's happening. That's uh, the Bartlett. In the meantime, I've got uh, number seven. So we're teaching from that building. That's them inside. They're quite pokey, but adequate. A um, few shots of the accommodation block. So they're 10 units, two students per unit or general public. Uh, that is overlooking with my back to the two small houses, looking toward the three houses that are being built now. So small workshops on the right, accommodation on the left, the big workshops over to the right off the screen. So that is, if you remember that concrete box, that's it today. So it's now a meadowland and wildflowers and grass. Grass seems to be winning that arm wrestle. Um, but these are the buildings up against the woodland the restaurant. I think we're coming near to the end. Um, these are the workshops, uh, sorry, the, the houses. So again, this is really quite fun because I designed the boxes and then the clients, this is what they do. They design houses. They're designers and makers themselves. So who am I to try to steer them onto what these houses are going to be like in the end? And it's, it's, as an architect, it is the, as far as I'm concerned, it is a far better way to work is that you allow some freedom for other people to input their ideas to what what goes on with these buildings. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But on this project, it's just about worked every time. Hey, it works. So we are now in the process of putting up one of our landscape architecture students. She's a PhD student, got a grant to start monitoring the forest. So they're flying drones. They put tree monitoring devices on tops of one of the small workshops, so it's measuring the weather every 40 seconds. It'll measure over a 10-year period the tree growth, light levels, um, probes in the ground um, so that they can see what's going on in the soil and deep underground as well. Um, but it's all linked to the woodland to see how this develops over the next 10 years. So that's all information that can feed into the project and be used by others. Sorry, that's Chris... O'Callaghan, so he's the owner of the site and the man who's taken all the risk, and they have paid for this all themselves um, at risk, and that's Matt Blackwell, the, the site manager. That's what we're applying from permitted development. This is how we're going to get our workshop for the Bartlett and others into the bottom of the woodland, because right now we're building things in the woodland, and it's bloody muddy. In the winter, when you're building a ceramics kiln um, and a canopy, you're midway up your shins in mud down there. That's just the nature of the site. So if we can get this building down there and permitted development, it's a forestry barn. So it's basically open-sided barn that we can work from from the bottom of the site. And that's the last slide. Okay, that's it from me.